OK, so uh, in, a, in fact, all the pleasure is ours. And uh, we, we are honored uh, to have the chance to be here uh, this week. Uh, it's true, we, we, come in, we always come in bunches right, in school. So we don't, we don't try not to do a school alone, because uh, uh, it's a rather, to be a theory collaboration, it's a rather large one. And each of us has uh, their own uh, expertise, and they know things in very much detail. And it's much more fun to stay together. In fact, as you will see, we will use this time also for us to discuss, right? for discuss among us about uh, future projects and so on. So if you also, you know, at some point you always hear something that you might be interested in, or you want to propose us something, or you have ideas you want to discuss, uh, we are here. We are here for you for a week. And um, our goal is really to get to know each other uh, the most. Of course, your goal is to learn, and, uh, and our task is to teach you. Uh, but we, we really see this as a possibly the beginning of a, of a collaboration together. Okay? And this has been actually the case in 2011, when we went to this fantastic place in the north of India, uh, Sariska Palace, is a magical, a magical place. And this allowed us to meet uh, several of the, of the people, one or two of which are, are sitting uh, here today. Uh, which we, you know, then we passed up in Europe and then we came here. So there was a collaboration coming out of it. So I mean, they really like uh, this time to, to be more, even more than that. Uh, the time is mature, as we'll try to explain today, but things that you know uh, already. And it's a fantastic time for our interest, right, in collider physics. It will be better than that. We can exploit all we learn, all we plan. And there is much more to do ahead of us. So you let me switch uh, view. Um, this maybe. Let's try again. Uh, which one is that? The other one, the black one. Ah. No, no, but I need to change the view. I need to put. Ah, I'm already there. Sorry. So, okay, so it, it's, a, it's a very busy, it will be a very busy week. Uh, if you look at the program, uh, there, are, there are lectures in the morning and tutorials in the afternoon. So, our, our real idea is to give you an overview, and a gist of how things work in the morning, and to talk about physics. Mostly. So um, now we call this Magnus School, it's a short end, but really it's a, a collider phenomenology school. So what we are going to learn is uh, how phenomenology works mostly at collider. We'll have a bit uh, of information also from other way of making experiments uh, high in high energy physics. Uh, but the main focus is on collider physics, and, uh, and so we will give lectures, we'll talk about Higgs, uh, top standard model. Right, so that everybody is on the same page, and that we can build up on it, and then, uh, and then we will make a jump, right? So we will continuously jump between uh, the basics and the concepts, and hands-on uh, exercises, uh, time tutorial where you actually learn, really, with your hands how to run this code in particular, but most, more important, most important, how to become completely independent in doing phenomenology. So the way for you to, to think about it is that you know, after this school on Friday, you can go on by yourself completely and develop your own idea and your own project. Right? Teach your advisors about uh, uh, the code or the physics that you have learned. Right? That's the most fun part of it. Right? And, and then you, you, uh, you will be you know, on your own and ready to go. Okay, so really that you don't need anything else to, to pursue your idea. Okay, so it's a minimal set of information, will be packed, you will submerge by information. So take your time to think, to try to organize, but don't miss, uh, don't miss the afternoon opportunities at all costs to have your code installed and to be independent. Eh? It's like you getting a driver license, right? After that, you drive your, your car by yourself, okay?
So this first lecture is a, a, a very, very fast one, somewhat superficial one on uh, uh, collider phenomenology. So it's a, a summary of what you will be exposed during the week. Okay? So we start with the plan of the week, if you want, but in a way that, uh, you know, I, I anyway give you some information. Most of the information I'm giving now, this hour, is uh, uh, going to be repeated in the following. Okay? You mean that, you know, go more depth and in more detail in the following. So what is collider physics? Um, so it's a, controlled, uh, it's a controlled environment to study the laws of nature. Okay? So we reproduce the laws of nature. It's not like our friends doing uh, astronomy or astroparticle physics, where they, like, you know, we call these the physics of the fishermen, in the sense that you sit and then try to fish something out, because you don't control the, the physics, right? You just wait and observe. Well, collider, the, the fun part of the collider is that it's a controllable, completely control, controllable environment. So we control the initial condition, we control the experiment, and then based on the information we have in the beginning, we can reconstruct what we see backwards uh, at the end. So the elements of collider uh, physics are, of course, a collider, right? You need that to start with. And the collider is a, typically nowadays a big machine where we collide these of particles head on. But then there are elements. Uh, uh, there are elements, two big elements that come into the play. One element is a theory, and the, one, and the other one is experiment. So how many of you are experimentalists in this audience? Yes, you are your, our hero, right? <laughs> so all, all questions we will have. Uh, What's your name? Okay, and it will be to, to him to ask all questions we have about experimental physics. At least we know who to ask, right? So it's, that's, that's uh, easy. So by, by complementarity, I hope all the others are theorists. Let's see, how many theorists do we have? Do we have undecided? <laughs> <laughs> Very good. So. Uh, so you know what I'm talking about, right? So in order to, to get something out of data, you need theory, right? And this goes, uh, goes under the name of interpretation. So I'm giving a bit of a lexicon because I will use these words. So when I talk about interpretation, I, mean, I really mean that uh, someone has made a measurement and we try to see what this measurement imply all other theory, okay? So interpretation can go both ways, actually, right? It can be a bottom-up way of interpreting. We make a measurement which uh, somewhat is driven by minimal amount of information from theory, and then we interpret it, or the other way around, right? In a, in a, uh, in a top-down way where we, we have a, a model, we strongly believe in it, we make prediction, and then we check on the data, in the data, if, uh, um, if this prediction uh, corresponds to what we see. So there are a, a number of elements that make up theory. For this school, it's enough that we talk about quantum field theory. We don't need string theory yet, but if, some, if someone, uh, uh, again, uh, knows about string theory, actually, there are ways, right? There are uh, even implications if this, super, uh, this string theory leaves in small uh, low scales. Uh, that could be have an effect even in uh, our uh, world, like extra dimension is one example of that. So we will, we will review how to really go from the, your Lagrangian, right, to model, you know, thinking about models, and then to generate cross-section, to, to calculate cross-section, to generate events, and to compare these events with what we actually measure in the experiments. So, as you know, our measurements are not uh, are limited, both by principle than by uh, technical abilities. So we don't, we don't know many things when we register, we take a picture of an event. But what typically we learn is that for each particle, <coughs> actually for each object, uh, we get to know the momentum, the energy, the angles. So the information that we get in our detector, and then with that information, we try to build the story backwards 
in time to, to learn what was the original, uh, what, what the original event uh, and the physical process that took care. So there are many steps here too. Here they go backwards, right? I mean, you go from the experiments to having a more and more abstract uh, uh, construction uh, of it, and here you go down instead, and you meet in the middle, right? Where you make the comparison. Where actually we meet is a subject of continuous discussion in the community with the experimentalists. Okay, so um, nothing of so this feature is very simple, but in fact. Uh, is uh, again is something that we discuss constantly with our fellow experimentalists because somewhat uh, where to stop here, where to make the comparison with theory is continuously under discussion depending on uh, uh, what kind of physics you want to extract or what kind of goals you might have. So this looks <coughs> obvious, but when you go down to the detail, even after the technical problems, where to stop, where to make the comparison, is continuously a subject of discussion. And even for us, for phenomenologists, even when we write papers, to which point do we have to make the simulation accurate, right? If we stop at particle level, or we want everything at the uh, you know, physical level, or we even we go up to the detector level, it's always a matter of choice and depending really on what is your goal, okay? so. Keep in mind that all this, even though it's schematic, is continuously being discussed. So how many colliders uh, there have been? Many, right? Uh, we go back to the 80s, uh, even 70s, uh, to uh, the uh, 90s, where the Tevatron and Fermilab uh, uh, was running in the beginning of the, of the thousand. And then finally, we come to the LHC, which is, uh, which is not running now, right? For the like today is not running and will be not running until a one year and a half or so in 21. So it's in a stop, technical stop now, before what is called a run free. Huh? So the, you, we all know, right, the LHC is a PP collider, proton, proton collider, which uh, now works at uh, 13 TV of um, collider uh, total energy in the central mass. So I remind something uh, which you should, we should know, right? Why we do colliders, right? Why, why we not just smash a beam against a fixed target? We actually do that. Uh, we continue, we actually do both. Uh, we do collider, fixed target physics, fixed target experiment, and collider. Uh, we do both right now. Why? What is the advantage of doing fixed target? Who knows? Hmm? Yeah, the, the advantage, no, not an example. Yeah, I mean we have uh, several experiments. Milton, like exactly. Who is speaking? Okay, let's see. Ah, thank you. I, I, you your mouth was not mo uh, moving. <laughs> okay, so yeah, yeah, that's exactly. So when we go want to go to very high energy, it's here. So because uh, if you just do the math, right, the the typical mass available. The energy available to, to make up a mass is, goes uh, linearly uh, uh, with, the, with the energy of the beam. So if you want to go higher in energy, you build a collider, right? It's here, linearly with energy. Uh, the energy of fixed target was only quadratic, you know, square root uh, of E. So we don't grow with energy very much uh, in the central mass frame, uh, right? Which is what we care. So this doesn't grow very much, but it, it gives us the possibility of having very large luminosity, very many events, okay? So this is called intensity frontier, and this is called energy frontier. And then we are actually nowadays pursuing both, because we are looking also, we are not only searching new physics in the heavy uh, hand, but we are also looking for new physics, which is light, but possibly, and then we know that must, if it's light, must be very weakly interacting. Otherwise, we would have seen it already. Okay. So if we're looking for light physics weakly interacting, we build fixed colliders. If you're looking for fixed target experiments, if you're looking for high energy, we build colliders. Okay. So this is a, again a general thing. And then the the figure of merit of uh, a collider 
is of course its energy, but is also how many events you produce. So this is uh, one of the formulas that uh, we all need to remember. Right? The number of events which we produce is proportional to the cross-section <laughs> times the luminosity. The luminosity is a, a parameter of the, of the machine, and we don't, we don't uh, as physicists, we don't uh, manage luminosity directly, right? Are the machine people will do. And it depends integrated luminosity. So the, the um, differential luminosity is time and e any given time, and the integrated one is how many match luminosity we have uh, collected, so to speak. So if this is an L times sigma is number of events, so this is a dimensional quantity, so luminosity is measured as an inverse of a cross-section. So we, we measure luminosity in phantomers nowadays because uh, uh, of, the, uh, of the very large luminosity that we have in inverse phantomers. So in the next run, in run three of the LHC, we expect to collect uh, uh, something like 300 in total inverse phantomer. And in the high Lumi, in the next uh, 10 years, from 2025 uh, to 3035 or something like that, we will collect for 10 years data and we'll go up to 3,000 inverse phantomers. Okay? So 10 times the luminosity. Okay? So nowadays we are around 150. Okay, so uh, I hope all this. Uh, so who knows? About, so who knows about this? So I, I'm I'm saying things that you are supposed to so what, know. Uh, and then we uh, use one main formula for this for this uh, school. And the formula I is just uh, we just need one, in fact, right? One big one, and then we need uh, several satellite uh, formulas along the way. But we need one. Uh, and this one has this idea in it that we can actually make predictions at the LHC even though the physics uh, which is responsible for describing so what the wave function of a proton is non-perturbative and therefore we cannot very easily, at least uh, uh, now, uh, make computations for probabilities of finding partons into protons. So now our picture is very simple. Again, we fish out particles, so quarks or gluons, out of protons with a given probability. Then they collide a short distance. And we use a formula which, uh, maybe it's a bit down, sorry, I don't know if everybody can see it, but basically is, uh, is telling us that to some extent, to some very good level of approximation, we can factorize, uh, and factorization means uh, times, uh, okay? So it's classical, so what, right? You multiply probabilities as, uh, as things will not talk to each other. So this is some kind of classical statement, classical in the sense of uh, quantum mechanics or classical physics. So we have uh, somewhat a probability of fishing out uh, particles from the protons times a probability for these particles to uh, collide and gi give a, a given final state. Okay. So this part, why we do this? Because if we rewrite in this way, this, these terms here I measure from some experiment, and then I use QCD to make prediction on higher scales. And this part I compute it perturbatively mm, as an expansion in our parameters of the theory, uh, in our gauge parameters typically which uh, high scales are all small. Okay. So the idea is that we use perturbation theory here, and then here we use uh, uh, some equations, which are called legal equations, to evolve uh, the information that we measure low scale and high scales, but the, the origin of this information is non-perturbative. Okay. So this is basically the formula. We need a little bit of kinematics too, right, because uh, when we collide particles which uh, have uh, somewhat an internal structure, we don't, we don't exploit all the energy which is in the in initial protons. Okay? So that's the one of the um, uh, drawbacks of using protons. So why do we use protons to make collisions? Who knows? Anybody wants to try? 
Why don't why now we use protons and we don't use electrons, for example? Hmm? Radiation, right? Radiation. The radiation when we so we only know, well, we don't only know, but let's say we are very efficient in accelerating particles if we just kick them every time we see them. And if, if they're good linearly, uh, typically they need a very long, you know, they travel a very long distance, so we have to kick them very fast. Otherwise, we keep them on a circular orbit, and every time they pass close to me, I give a kick, right? So that's the idea why we use the, the circular colliders. Unfortunately, electrons are light, and they, and, you know, they radiate every charge, which is accelerated radiates, in a way which is inversely proportional to the fourth power of its mass. And therefore, basically, we can, uh, we can accelerate protons to very much higher energies because they radiate much less, right? They lose much less energy whenever they go in turn. However, we have a drop, you know, there is a, a always, like in life, right? There's always one good thing and one bad thing. You, you teach me this. And, uh, and therefore, uh, you know, one of the issues that we have is that not all energy is in the collision. But m a little bit slightly more complicated than that, the collision can, might not be in this. So the central mass of the collision might not be the lab. Right? Because if I have a very energetic one against a not very energetic one, all the thing is boosted forward. Okay, so a collider, uh, a proper collider, the information which we really use are typically transverse information because these are independent on boosts along the z-axis. Okay, so what are our uh, quantities? So imagine two particles that fuse into one. Then you have two quantities. You have the mass of the object you have produced and where, what is the, its momentum with respect to the lab in the z direction. So we call the second thing rapidity, right? So rapidity, you see, is the fraction, is the ratio of the fraction of energies. So if the fraction of energy is the same, y is zero. So it means that the particle, as the central mass frame of the particle, is the same as the lab. Okay, so there is no rapidity. So now you, you make a plot of uh, uh, x which is this uh, York and X, the fraction of energy of a particle, and the Q square, and you see what kind of, you know, what, what kind of kinematics your machine can access. So, um, to make a story short, if uh, um, the highest mass that you can get is when you use the same energy basically from both sides, a maximal energy from both sides. That's obvious. Right? So if something is central, or better, if something is very heavy, is very massive, is central. Okay. And, that's, and that's this triangle. Right? So if, uh, um, if something has a very large mass, it has an x which is large, and it has a very small range of rapidity. Right? It's not very much boosted. While if you want to look uh, at um, particles which are light, you can go to very also to very large rapidities. So that's why, for example, we have uh, LHCD and uh, uh, LHC, which is a, a machine and uh, sorry, an experiment which produces bees, right? Which whose aim, main goal is to produce bee quarks. Bee quarks are super light, right? And this energy, so we have a lot of cross section in the forward region. So you don't build a four pi detector, you build something in the forward region, and that's enough for you, because most of your first section at the end will be there. Right? So, so that's, uh, that's something that you have to keep in mind. Something heavy is central, and being central will be high PT in the, in the detector. Something which is light might be, and uh, that does not necessarily need to be, but it might be also very forward. Okay? So very much boosted. Is that clear? OK, so that, that's important. Uh, well, these are, I, um, let me, uh, well, so I wanted to give you a, a simple example of a calculation, as we will see many this, this week. Um, I don't know how much time I have, but I'll, I'll let me go uh, quick 
so that you can take the slide and do the calculation yourself. So there are ways of doing this computation. So this is what worry, uh, will take, uh, keep us busy for the week, to make this computation. There are many ways of doing it. There are sophisticated ways and simple ways. So I'm showing you now a very simple one. But I will be lightning fast, uh, because I cannot go into the details right now. So I remind you the elements, right? You want to compute a cross section. So you have a flux, you divide by the initial flux. It's a kind of normalization of a probability. And then uh, uh, you have your matrix element square, which comes from your quantum field theory. It's really the description of the, um, uh, of the physics process. And then you integrate over phase space. What does that mean? It means you sum over all possible outcomes. Okay? So you can go particles here, there. So you have to, this is a differential probability, you have to integrate over all possible outcomes of your physics process to get a probability which is normalized. So you learn in school, right? Uh, this you use Feynman diagrams, and this you need to do integrals. And integrals, is, you know, sooner or later you never know how to do them, right? And if you know, and then uh, uh, typically you even keep it for yourself <laughs> until you, you write a paper, right? So nowadays also this is the case, right? You, I mean, some of the cutting edge te technology is to, make, to know how to do uh, analytic <coughs> integrals. It's a very difficult task. So this week we'll do numerical, eh? we'll do integrals numerically. We are not that good yet. Okay. So how you want to do this? Well, you know, you, you can even do it on the back of the envelope to make an estimate. Eh? And how? Well, back of the envelope almost. Right? So what, what do you do? Well, you, you have to do a double integral. Uh, this is the conservation of energy, right? And the fact that, uh, as I said before, this is a set. The energy of the center of mass has to be equal to x1, x2, total s. And so you rewrite things uh, using uh, variables that uh, make things uh, more uh, easy. And then you realize uh, that if you want to do a cross-section in terms of a set, you can actually factor out uh, a big piece of it uh, and compute it once for all. So you can compute once for all what is called the particle luminosity. Uh, given the initial state here, I'm giving an example of gluons. So I'm calculating glue glue to TT bar. So this is important. You can actually combine the information of the gluon densities in one quantity, which gives you the probability of getting the S at, uh, getting something from gluon fusion, and then give it energy in the parton, parton frame. Mm -hmm. So this, this quantity here, you see, it does not depend on sigma at. So it's, uh, it's universal. It does not depend on the detail of the interaction. It just gives you the probability that two gluons, integrated probability, that two gluons come out uh, with this energy integrated over the rapidity. OK? So this, uh, this uh, second integral is really on this line here. So to get, for example, 100 GV energy, you can integrate x from on this line. OK? So this gives you a, a quantity which you can compute once for all. It's called the particle luminosity. And then you rewrite things in a dimensional, dimensionless way. So you, you rewrite the, your integral in terms of a, something which is adimensional, uh, S set times a cross section, times a luminosity, some kind of a luminosity which is normalized. So at this point, you can even stop and make an estimate of the cross-section of TT bar with this information not going farther. Because now this object is a number, right? Is a, is a pure number. And a pure number uh, for TT bar for cross-section will only depend on the coupling, how the gluon couple to the top. So the, you will draw a Feynman diagram, one of them possible, right, for glue glue for TT bar. And then you realize, right, that uh, the coupling, what is the order in alpha s for this diagram, for this cross section? So for this diagram, the order in alpha s is gs squared, right, because there are two couplings. 
And if I square the amplitude, I get Gs to the fourth, which is uh, uh, alpha. Right? Alpha is square for the cross section. That's all. Right? That's all you need. And then the other scale you might use is mt. But this is an animational number. So if you have mt, you have to divide by mt square, you have to divide by square root of s. So you get a number again. So the only thing you have is alpha s. So you can just use alpha s, and you will get, actually, you get this number from, uh, from the computer, the system that you have to go and compute this luminosity once for all from the PDF that you find on the web. Right? So you, you, you compute uh, this object, luminosity. You multiply by alpha s squared, and you get something which is order of a nanobar. Right? You can do it yourself. You get something which is order of a nanobar in the LHC. Right away, you didn't do any calculation almost. The only thing you have to do is to get this luminosity out of uh, your PDFs, which you get from the LHC, the files. Or you can also do something even uh, analytic, in the sense you can mimic this with an analytic function. This uh, needs a normalization, right, which you still like to get. So you basically, what you can do is to fit this thing analytically, get the coefficient in front, and then do the computation uh, yourself, huh? computing the diagram. So this is level two, and we will do this uh, uh, numerically uh, in this class. So now it's starting to be complicated because you have to compute three diagrams, square them, and so on. So I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, doing it. But basically what I'm saying is that by doing this uh, yourself, uh, and this will take an afternoon right, to do it uh, correctly. Well, correctly might take even longer. Right, but let's say for you to do the computation once uh, and maybe getting it wrong uh, will take uh, you know one afternoon. Still, you can uh, with this formula already predict, uh, and this is interesting, the shape of the invariant mass of the TT bar. Okay, from this simple calculation. So I did it once uh, to to train myself, uh, and uh, I plot it with Mathematica, this very naive uh, formula, and then I compare with the uh, cool pools, right, the stuff that next to living on accuracy and so on. And they see that, you know, I don't do it that bad after all. It's not an accurate prediction. That's what we call, this is an accurate one. We can rely on it. But I can get the shape pretty well, actually. Now, this is normalized, but uh, I assure you, this, these two things are pretty much uh, similar. And then you realize, right, you learn something which is uh, important for a phenomenologist, which is uh, whenever you produce uh, two heavy objects, there is a, 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 a region of energy, right, the total invariant mass for these two objects. At the beginning, the probability grows because the threshold, the probability of producing something at the threshold is small. It's suppressed by the threshold factor, this beta. So it's always uh, small, the probability of producing things at rest. So the probability goes up and gives some kind of maximum, which is order of is related to the top mass, twice the top mass, or four times the top mass, and then it goes down. Why does it go down? Does it go down? It, go do it goes down because the, it costs you energy to produce tops with very a lot of kinetic energy. And this, you pay a price with a PDF of the gluon. So the PDF of the gluon, I showed you before, they go down very steeply. So as soon as you are, uh, over this uh, maximum, you go down very quickly because it costs energy, right? In the probability of fishing out a gluon and very high energy from the proton, it goes down extremely fast, right? So by this simple uh, calculation, I learned already things that we should all know, right, when we think about collider physics. Uh, the threshold behavior, it increases the probability, and the tail behavior, it goes down. Okay. Okay. <coughs> so the other thing that you will learn, uh, and this will make a very the short, super, the story super short, is that the, the our ability to compute this uh, uh, object at short distance is based on perturbation theory. Right? It's all. Uh, it's basically all we can do. Right. So whenever we don't know how to do something, physicists first thing they do, they Taylor expand. 
right? They expand, and then <laughs> they check maybe with the small parameters I can, I can do something. And that's exactly what we do. And uh, these computations are uh, crazy, are very, are very tough. But uh, the technology has, has allowed us to make predictions which we compare with, uh, with experiments. So these are measurements of total cross-section and LHC. And the compare results are done at different level of accuracy. Leading order, next to leading order, next to next to leading order. Every time you add an n, it's easy to write. Uh, one more n. But uh, to calculate, uh, you have to think that you go at least one order of magnitude complexity. And actually more than that. So it's not uh, stuff for everybody. So who ha has ever done a next to next, a next to leading order computation in their life? A next to next to leading order one? Oh, wait. I think I did once, yeah. But it was very easy. And actually it was already done. So I just I just used the, the results of other people. So I I I, I take it back. Yeah. I take it back. Yeah. Yeah, no, fixed order, fixed order. Yeah, that's two things. So, you know, the number of people in the world who actually do next to next to leading order computation, uh, it's very few. Some of, some of them are in this room. Um, and the next to next to next order is even less than uh, a hand, right? And so uh, it's really a, an, elite, uh, a, an elite club, OK? So it's, it's good that we, we can talk to them and learn, OK? OK, uh, so um, let me. Uh, let me summarize what I, I, I just talked about in a small movie for you to remember, right? So this is uh, a movie and the quiz is uh, basically a movie that, that we have been showing at all Netgraph schools. So it's, uh, it's a real event, I mean, it's a, a real Monte Carlo event. In a sense, uh, it's a pithy event, right? So it's one, it's not a true event, of course, it's a generic one, but this is a movie out of a an event record out of a, a real code of Monte Carlo, which we will use this week. So it's a visualization of an event which we have simulated with, uh, with Pythia. And uh, so the gray things are valence quarks, right? And then you see here that the valence quarks have bars on top. So this is not actually PP collision, is a P P-bar collision, so it's a thermotron collision, right? And that tells you how old this movie is. Okay. And uh, so now, now we uh, this should go at the speed of light, more or less. So I'm slowing, I'm slowing this down a bit. Uh, okay, for for you to have a look. So now you have to tell me what happens, right? That's the that's the game. You can breathe. Uh, can. Uh, uh. Okay, so what's to try? Only people who have not seen the movie before. Otherwise cheating. So what's to try? What happened? Should I show you the thing? Ready? Yes, so? Anybody? Okay, so let, let's follow it closely. Okay, so what, what do we see here? Okay, so this was a, a, a and this came from where? So we see this spark, right? 
<laughs> so the spark is a visualization, right? I mean, there's, there's no spark. Or maybe there was, I don't know. I see. It's where factorization. Yes. Exactly. The magic. The magic. So you had the U U bar. Okay. Uh, sorry. Too many arrows. Is it Majorana U bar? Yeah. Uh, right. And then uh, a T. A T bar. So uh, I produce a, a pair of quark antiquark pair from the annihilation of the U U bar, right? Because the U U bar doesn't exist after, and all of a sudden I get the T T bar. So what's going on in the middle? Who wants to guess? So we are, uh, yeah. So let's do, so let's start to understand Monte Carlo. So we do an unweighted guessing, okay? So most of the people have to, wait to guess the most probable thing. And the one, you, because uh, you're the only experimentalist, so we know it's one. Uh, you have to guess the less probable one in one over 100. Got it? So we generate numbers distributed like reality right, in, in a moment. So uh, what is the most probable thing? Right, it's the gluon, right? Because uh, alpha, alpha s, right? Alpha s is 10 times bigger um, than uh, alpha electromagnetic, right? So this is uh, uh, 10 times alpha m. Okay, so this is alpha s squared. So this pro the probability of the gluon is 100 times bigger then what? A photon, very good, or a Z, right? Let's say, photon or a Z. So you have to say photon and Z, or everybody else has to say dual, and then we are generating the right, you know, so what? There's a Z prime in there too. Yeah, Z prime, uh, we need uh, all India probably. <laughs> uh, uh, but you got it, okay? So you actually have both, right? You have both. In reality, they are both, but most of the time is a gluon, and one in one hundred time is actually a photon that produces the TT bar. And then, if there is a Z prime, as Richard was saying, it maybe is one over a billion times or so on. Okay, so it's not that this is right, this is wrong. It's both of them with different probabilities. Very good. And then, what happens after? They decay, right? The top, uh, they're not, the top, as we will learn uh, on Friday and Wednesday, doesn't live uh, forever, right? Like the Queen song. Yeah. Okay. It, do, it doesn't live uh, forever. Uh, it, uh, it decays, uh, it decays in WB immediately. Right? In a, Actually, it decays so fast, right, is, uh, is the only quark that decays uh, so fast, uh, is the top, I don't understand why. So it decays to WB, and then the W also decays very fast, uh, and it decays into what? So in this uh, movie, one, one, one W decays into charm anti strange, and the other one decays to electron, uh, to electron neutrino. Okay, and uh, and then once these go, what happens to the quarks? What happens to them? They analyze right away. Not really, right? Not really. They for, they are like accelerated. Uh, they are accelerated charge, and therefore, what do they do? They first radiate. And then they analyze. Okay, remember this because we talk about this over and over again, right? So produ production, right? Then there is a decay short distance. The the quarks uh, might decay or might analyze and then decay, right? It's the only top that decays before analyzing. The bees will analyze and then decay, right? The bee mesons. Okay, very good. So you did very well. 
So, uh, you know, at the end, we'll have something as complex as this picture, where we actually, and this will explain over and over, we'll divide these things up in steps. Uh, and we will be allowing this because uh, uh, of this famous factorization theorem. So we can actually do the description one thing at a time, right? one phase of our life at a time. So it's like our life, not really, actually, but um, so that, you know, what we do, what I do now does not interfere with my, uh, when I was a teenager, right? So I'm a, I'm a classical object, right? I don't, I don't change my life by interfering with my choices when I was a teenager, right? Well, uh, yeah. Uh, so that, that's exactly the story of the way we think about stories of events and colliders. However, in each of these blobs, we use quantum mechanics, okay? So things interfere. So remember that most of the time we actually, uh, when we separate the, the life of, a, of an event, we, we break it in pieces, uh, in steps, right? You know, uh, born, uh, teenager, uh, maturity, so I'm here, right? And myself, I'm, I'm down here in the organization phase of my life. And, uh, and then, then uh, uh, each, each part, right, each part has its own model and uh, way of uh, dealing with it. And you will learn a lot about this. Okay, so I, I give you a, a summary of, uh, do we have 15 minutes? 15. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so summary. So let me make a summary so far. Uh, we can probe using high energy collisions we can probe our knowledge of fundamental interaction at very low scale in a controlled environment. We, we need to do that. We need to measure observables, uh, physical quantities, which uh, on one side we can measure, and on the other side we can calculate. We can measure a lot of stuff that we cannot calculate. Right? And this is not always useful. Right? Typically it's not, because then we cannot compare with theory. So we always have to think that we have to compute and measure objects which are defined in the same way. Okay? This is super important for QCD. It's less important for uh, electronic interaction, but in, in the level of precision we are now, it's also important there, in fact. So keep in mind that this game works if we use the same definition, experiment, and theory of observables. And then the game uh, is to make accurate, as accurate precision as possible to make this comparison possible and either to measure quantities accurately or to discover something which is not predicted, right? Which was not in our model at the beginning. So it turns out uh, that to make this game uh, possible and to talk to the experimentalist uh, in a serious way, our ability um, to make uh, full exclusive prediction, to make prediction like uh, this uh, tree which I've shown, right, this movie, is essential. And not only in a rough way, but we need to do it in an accurate way. To be able to really study the interaction at the level of uh, accuracy and precision where we will start to learn something from them. Okay? So it's not a game which we can more or less play. We have to play it in an accurate way, which means that we also have to have an history of an event which is, uh, uh, which is accurate. OK. So in the last 10 minutes, I'll give you uh, a picture which uh, um, you, you will continuously use in the, during this week. And uh, to make you understand and to make all of us appreciate the fact that there are various ways which we can discover new physics and let's see everybody wants to be famous right so either one uh, either you go to hollywood or bollywood or you uh, or you uh, discover a new particle and then it's it right or you you make up a new model and then it turns out that this is what the people have discovered so it's true proton proton machines are discovery machines are built to discover new things we discover the Higgs, 
which was new because we didn't install it before, but a lot was predicted very, very, very well in our model. So it's a confirmation and a great discovery. So the, the question that we have to ask and that you have to be aware of is how do we discover new uh, things, quote in quotes, at colliders? Uh, and precise and in related to this is, uh, well, you're going to tell us for a week uh, that you, we need to do uh, simulations accurately. We need to know what we are doing to a level which is uh, never needed, was never needed before. But why? What, what, what is, is it like a mantra or is it really true? I right? really need, do I need really very good prediction to make discoveries in the LHC or not? Right? This is a very important question, a very important one. It's the non trivial one. Okay. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll try to simplify. I try to simplify this, uh, this question a bit. Uh, okay. And I try to uh, sketch uh, and the way we think, I, I think about this uh, uh, and several other, other people do. So what we have done so far at the LHC, most of the people, and most of us, all of us, what they've done is, uh, you know, we were waiting for the LHC to start, and then all theorists were working, maybe there are x dimension, there is 2 x double model, there is SUSY. So every theorist has his own new physics model in mind, and we were all dying to test this as soon as the first interaction came in 2009, okay, 2010. Now, it is also true that uh, Whenever you switch on an, a collider at very high energy, your uh, discovery potential is very, very large in the beginning. Okay? This is a, a statement which depends on what you're looking for. It's not a universal statement. But let's say for things like stops like, or heavy colored particle, this is true. I mean, uh, the, the first the discovery uh, might come even with a very low integrated luminosity, it's just an energy issue. Is how much energy you put in, then you can produce something. You don't need a, to wait a long time, and then if it's there, you will. Okay. So I call these searches fast and furious. Okay. Why? Because uh, you almost don't need anything. You just need the machine to start, and just to look at resonances or four five or states which are very energetic, and then you will have a discovery potential right away. Okay. Then as these, uh, uh, these things are excluded, then to gain, uh, to extend your reach, uh, this takes time. Mm -hmm. This takes time, and, uh, and therefore you have to somewhat change your strategy. So this uh, kind of picture where you have a model and you look for the consequences of your model, I call it model dependent, right? So you design analysis to discover something that you have in the back of your mind. Otherwise, you can also do something which is model independent. Okay, this is a totally different game because you don't stick to a model, a new physics model, but you look for mostly signatures. Huh? So you go into this um, uh, third category. So I'm trying to build categories which are uh, independent one from another. Okay. So this model independent one uh, is something where you look at an events where you don't know what you're looking for, but you want to see if there is a difference with respect to the standard model prediction. Okay. Or you can look for new states, right? And in mind to look for uh, a heavy Higgs or a stop, some new particles. Or you can look for new interactions, right? You can say, well, maybe there are no new particles, but there are the interaction between the known ones are different from what the standard model predicts, OK? And uh, or you look for exotic signatures, like multi lectons, same sign lectons, things which are not even present in the standard model, or so rare that you can assume that they don't exist in the standard model. Or you look for, for standard signatures, a final state which exists in the standard model, 
but you look for deviations again, right? So now, if you pay attention to these uh, three different ways, you might have realized that every time I was talking on this orange side, I was mentioning difference with respect to the standard model, while on this side, I never thought, I never mentioned differences with respect to the standard model. Okay, why? Because of the methodological difference, which is enormous. Here, to make these searches, I basically don't need uh, accurate prediction from the standard model. I need rough predictions for BSM, but not accurate ones to make the discovery on a uh, standard model. While if I hit this orange line, I always work by differences. And if I don't know the standard model well, my sensitivity will be low because I will have a large uncertainty in the standard model. And then since I'm measuring a difference, my sensitivity will be affected by this. OK, so there are two games uh, in town. There is uh, the game which is typically summarized with the discovery of the Higgs. So did we need any theory to discover a scalar particle in 125 GB? One well, has to be careful, right? But let's say for the sake of this argument that I'm giving now, the answer is no. Okay. You will, because we didn't need where it, we didn't know where it was, right? We didn't know it was 125. That, that was unknown. What we knew is that if it were standard model, it would have decayed in this way and that other way. And then we have built a detector to maximize our sensitivity to the final state which we knew from theory it would go to the Higgs. So it's not true that we didn't use a theory. Okay? But what I'm talking now is something more sophisticated. I'm talking about, for example, theory of the background. Did I, know, did I need to know the background here from theory? No. Right? Because I measured from the side bands. Right? I don't need anything. To discover a peak, I don't need theory. Right? I need very good experimental collaboration and work. I don't need theory. Now, to know that this is a Higgs of the standard model, I need theory. Right? Because otherwise, how, how do I know? No, I, I can see a resonance, but how do I know is the standard model Higgs? The only way is to measure the cross section, the coupling, and so on. And then, if I want to do it in an accurate way, then I need theory to the same accuracy I want to get to that point of knowledge of this particle. But to discover it, no. Right, is that clear? So the discovery of a resonance typically does not entail any knowledge of theory, any theory very pushed one. Okay. Uh, so remember this because this is important. Of course, to get to know this particle well, then you know, you need to know her very well, all the characteristics very well, predict um, them very well, and then your way, your ability of saying that it's something or something else. Then this depends on theory. OK. Uh, so uh, since my time is up, there is a, a, the other side of the, of the story, right? In searches for new interaction. You will have two lectures on this. Can we lecture on this approach, right? Which is becoming more and more uh, fashionable or used, let's say, because of this thing that I was saying to you before. Because the reach for discovering high mass will be, for strong interacting particles, will be uh, used at the beginning, right? Has been already used. So uh, I, I'm going to, to be uh, fast here. So the idea here is to actually write effective field theories. So uh, the idea is that new physics is too heavy to be accessed rationally. I cannot, I don't have enough energy to produce a Z-prime. So, so what I see are the decay products of the Z-prime, and the Z-prime has not been produced uh, 
of shell. Right? It's exactly as the mu of decay. It's exactly the frame interaction. We will dig into it in more detail. But the idea is that I can access, for example, a four fermion interaction, an energy below the mass of a possible Z prime. So imagine there is a Z prime at 10 TV or a, of 20 TV. I cannot produce it at LHC. But I can still produce QQ to TT bar, right? Like here. Right, where a Z prime, as, uh, as Richard was saying, I have a Z prime here, which is too heavy, right, to be produced resonantly. And therefore, my Q squared is smaller than Mz. Right? There is no peak, there is no right there, right here in their peak. This can be neglected, and then you get a four frame interaction like uh, the Fermi interaction. So, this feature, this idea is not new at all, right? It goes back to Fermi in this, uh, in this frame. But so there is a revival of this possibility of actually accessing new physics and LHC through studying the interactions and not the new states. But in order to do that, we need to know the standard model very, very well. Because we will not see a P, we only see deviations from the standard model prediction. And uh, we can do that only if you know the standard model extremely well. Right? To the same level, we want to have sensitivity for new physics. Okay? So this will be explained uh, in very much detail. So this is an example. Right? Here in TT bar, where I added some of these operators. And you see, this is the invariant, plus, the invariant mass plot I was shown before. I don't get something completely different. I don't see a peak here. I get some deformation of the standard model prediction. So I have to be extremely good in predicting the standard model, which is the blue one, with a very small uncertainty, to be able to put limits on this kind of new interaction, exactly as I was explaining before. So my back of the envelope estimate of this observable will not work. My next leading one uh, uh, is already quite good, actually. But it might not even be sufficient. Fortunately, we know this distribution in next to next reading order. Right? And that's what we use uh, on, uh, on our analysis for new operators. Okay? So search of new states resonances, very little need for theory to make discovery. Search for new interactions, I need theory because the differences are small. Okay? And this is the game which we will be doing for the next 10 years, together with this one. right? We're not dropping any game. We are just doubling our uh, possibilities for uh, probing new physics. OK? So uh, I, I, I close. So the, the aim of the week for you is, of course, first to think, to participate. So please ask questions at any time. And of course, work in the afternoon. OK? Uh, so you have uh, the chance to have a, a, a Madras, uh, Madras Medrim uh, uh, team. Uh, so I want to thank personally all, uh, all of them, because they came uh, a long distance here. It's a wonderful team. I'm, I'm learning, I'm basically learning every day, uh, every night uh, from, from them. And I'm so happy that uh, you guys made it here today. So you will get the lectures uh, from uh, um, all of these uh, brilliant guys. And you also will get tutorials. So we have a special team for tutorials, a team for teaching. We are all teams. Okay? So that's, uh, uh, that's the goal of this school. So enjoy.